I can still feel that kind of sucking in of holding and trying to find a way to be okay. I felt I was more embraced when it was stormy, when the waves were crashing because I was holding tight, that I needed that release, a place where I could be in tune with the waves, with the wind, and, and move quite frenetically if I needed to. I found that in company, I would be really, really, well, just not being able to speak <laughs> and, and just want to retreat all the time. You know, whether it's just doing the shopping, or going to an event or to meet up friends, I just couldn't connect. The only place I could connect was at that time at the beach and um, with the water, with the sea, the ocean. Welcome to Wildflow Podcast with me, Charlotte Puanto. I'm an internationally award-winning menstrual cycle and embodiment coach, cycle mysteries guide, and founder of the First Moon Circle School of Menstrual Education for Children. Tune in for deep, heartfelt conversations with wisdom keepers, embodied leaders, and change makers on themes from cyclical living in flow with your menstrual cycle and body's wisdom, reclaiming rites of passages to normalize period positivity for you and the next generation, and exploring our embodied experiences, soulful transformations, and intuitive wisdom guiding you to express and embody your full power in the change you want to see in the world. Are you ready? Let's fly. Hello, beautiful women. Thank you for listening to Wild Flow. Today's episode is a really lovely conversation, a deep and moving one, and I'm excited to introduce you to my guest, Amanda Bond. Amanda Bond is a wild edge walker, a woman living literally on the edge of a continent who has met the edges of her identity, her roles as wife, mother and daughter of her menstrual cycle years and the edge of the natural world within her and around. Amanda is a certified nature and forest therapy guide living in Jersey. She's a circle facilitator and she has been a practitioner of vibrational earth-based rooted compassionate heart-centered therapies for 18 years. Amanda offers relational guidance in reconnecting with nature, self, others and the earth and after receiving a message from a glacier on the South Island of Oteoroa, she began to get to know the plant realms in early 2015. As Amanda navigates the depths of her grief, many sudden life-shattering moments of life as she knew it giving way, she had found solace, safety and wholeness in nature. In this episode of Wild Flow, Amanda and I wandered through themes including how living on the edge has given Amanda the ability to self-regulate, and find safety, especially in relation to supporting her sensitivity and neurodivergence. Her pain at not being held by others in her experiences of profound loss and how she found safe places to feel, cry and release in nature. The earth as mother who can help us come back to wholeness. Medicine walks, vision quests and forest therapy as tools for grounding, reconnecting and opening up our senses and finding inner healing. Menstrual cycle issues as manifestations of loss and grief and nature's regulating effects. Crowning ceremonies and how Amanda is feeling the call to be initiated into her crondom. And what the wisdom of the cycles has offered Amanda. Tune in with a cuppa for this heartfelt conversation. Welcome Amanda to the Wild Flow podcast. How are you today? I'm really good. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Oh, I'm good. really happy to be here. Beautiful. I'm looking forward to getting to know you and having this chat. So let's start off with a cycle check-in as we always do. Um, and I'll go first and then invite you to, to share yours. So um, a cycle check-in to me begins with a menstrual cycle check-in and then just checking in with how I'm feeling in relation to the other cycles and seasons um, within and around me, um, just as a way to to drop into what's going on for me and what's going on in, 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 in the, um, the space around me as well. So for me, um, I'm at an interesting place in my menstrual cycle. Actually, I didn't, um, ovulate last cycle because I had, um, I had COVID. And so I'm 
now in my day day early 50s i've i've just realized i've lost count it's something like day 52 um so a longer cycle for me which i've not had in a while um and just um when i've been in this position before and not had um a menstrual cycle for a really long time um it's helpful to, for me to stop stressing about what's going on and where things are at and where it should be and just be with what is um and um it it's it's not like being in a uh, a, a usual season of a menstrual cycle it doesn't feel like well i haven't ovulated yet so it's it's a spring it feels like a sort of draining limbo land at times, neither here nor there, a bit of a void. So um, I've, I've got some decent energy um, and and confidence and clarity, um, but also I can feel that dwindling. It's like the end of the end of my tether is is in sight, and I'm hoping for for my bleed soon so that I can have a bit of a, a reprieve, um, but. In place of that, I'm just um, leaning into uh, the moon cycle, um, which really helps me to live as if I have that menstrual cycle still. Um, so at this point, you and I, you're in um, Jersey, which um, you can tell us in a minute, but um, just off the coast of the UK in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere, but no matter what, we share the same moon. Um, and so we are, um, past the third quarter moon coming up to the last few days of, of this moon cycle. Um, and so really in that descent and that disintegration and the, the really fading light, um, and, and energy is, is really present with the moon. So that feels quite like where I'm at, I guess, in my body. Um, and so I'm going to try to take some time over the next few days around the new moon sort of time um, in order to give myself um, a bit of rest time and integration time and, and ask my husband to take the kids for a little bit just so that I can, uh, you know, pretend I've got my period and give myself that reset that it would normally offer to me. So um, that's how I like to, 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 uh, the moon can remind me of, of having a cycle even without anything necessarily happening in any consistent way in myself um, so that I don't keel over and burn out. And we're also just past the winter solstice here. Um, so we are about probably about halfway ish between um, the winter solstice, which is the Yule Sabbat and in bulk, which will be the first glimpse of um of spring on the horizon so we are very much still in deep winter but uh the light is just starting to grow i'm noticing that it's already not dark um at 5 15 which it has been for quite a while which feels lovely just that little first glimmer of of hope um so i uh yeah that's that's where i'm going to leave that for my check-in today um and uh, I'm going to invite you, Amanda, to just share with us um, if there's any seasons, cycles that you connect with and just how you're feeling, perhaps in relation to that as well. Thank you, Charlotte. And that was really fascinating listening to where you're at in your cycle and your perception of how you relate to those cycles and in your own life. I guess, um, to start with, I'm a Amanda and I live on a tiny island just off the coast of Normandy and Brittany in northern France. Um, so I'm on the edge of the European continent, um, northernmost point of, of that coastline. Um, and I feel like an edge walker. So that's where I am very often in cycles. Um, so I um, don't have a menstrual cycle anymore. I went through the menopause in my early 40s through shock and trauma. And so I was gifted space afterwards without any menopausal typical symptoms. So um, my time was like abrupt 
really cutting an edge. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how that's just come out. Um, so yeah, it, I didn't hadn't really ever thought of it that way before. Um, so even as an edge walker, I did that. You know, there's like one to the other. So, but mm. right now, how I'm relating to cycles in my life, I really um, kind of connect with the new moon, particularly. Um, so, and the dark side of the moon, particularly. So, mm. I always go you know, really deep in that um, time before the new moon and um, really explore matters meaning to me um in all aspects of my life and i think right now i'm on a, a a great threshold i found that the period since going through the menopause has been really enlightening and um i'm growing more and more into my authentic self mm. probably more so than i have ever done in my life and um, so the about being visible is very much in my kind of um, thoughts, processes at the moment. And how do I do that? Am I visible? And so even, you know, this um, coming to be here was challenging as things externally apparently prevented me initially with our um, first scheduled appointments, but now being here is just at the right moment because I'm on standing on a real threshold, and it's it's the opening up of something new, and I'm quite curious as to what it eventually will manifest. Because then, right now, I'm really um, embodying this sense of the of the rising of the Pleiades. And in the in the southern hemisphere, and I always seem to connect with that new moon rising, or, or sort of new the stars rising, um, as the new year. So I, I'm really feeling that right now. And um, yes, yeah, so I'm in the summer, but it's a weird summer, and um, I'm really grateful just at this moment, having had a really intense couple of months. To finally thinking, whew, it was after the full moon. This mm. kind of lightness started to come in. And this week particularly, it's really um very noticeable that, oh, I've got time. Mm. And you know, the things that I've been put aside for quite a long time, I'm picking up and I'm giving myself this time between now and the beginning of September to accomplish things creative things that I've wanted to do for myself for a long time mm. um so it feels really really um potent and um again this time in my cycle as as a kind of as a woman then there's a huge shift um between like my early 40s and now so many extraordinary experiences that would never have dreamed of of even you know being in my kind of life um so i'm really thankful for the abrupt end to my marriage <laughs> which opened up that opportunity for me mm -hmm. and um taken a long time to get here however you know giving that space to um becoming and being um has been um such an extraordinary gift yeah thanks so much amanda that's so much in there so much wisdom and insight and so many pieces that just um like i can feel like this real alignment through all of these cycles and and seasons and all just like really kind of lining up in these own ways like it doesn't look like it lines up but there's these threads of similarities and alignment just there and wow that's that's really um 
really special to hear so thank you for sharing that uh, you know I'm really moved by what you were saying there about you know abrupt endings of being something that you've experienced and um but on the end on the other side of that has been opportunities for connection to you to your creativity to like what you know what what is it that you are wanting to do in life and who are you and um and you know like these possibilities that you've got over the next couple of months as well it's just it's like a beautiful reminder that that things can be abrupt and not as you expect at all but on the other side of that is is um yeah is hope and space and potential um for yeah new possibilities so that, that's that's just what I've been really struck by um and I'm really curious so you've called yourself um you're an edge walker or an, an edge dweller and I'd, I'd love to know you know you you called yourself as well um you refer to yourself as a a wild edge walker and I just would love to hear what what that means to you and why you have um sort of identified with that okay so it's a big question it's a question I've been I keep asking myself um so wild edge walker as a as a kind of name as a as a kind of identity for myself as to hold the potential of what I want to offer the world um allows me space to move in time as I need to so I'm not in the in the thrust of things I'm not in the melee of things all the time so that I can stand where I need to be so that I have enough space to be able to integrate and process all that I need to and supported by nature primarily and then dip in to different situations circumstances when it suits me obviously that doesn't always work but Mm. it's that kind of um you know standing my own ground and being able to move in a flow um in and out and I realized that I had pretty much done that all my life is I was never I was never able to um feel like I would belonged to one group of friends, for example, ever. And whether that was, you know, from my early childhood onwards. Um I would be much happier standing on the edge of a group and being able to move to the next group if I wanted to. Because I'm living in an island. It's at times been very close knit community, a lot of cliques, and um, I was never comfortable, you know, just being in one group and just like being just totally disregarding every everything else that's happening around you, and um, so I always floated, and um, it feels like a good place for me, and um, very recently. Um, I'd always been aware that I, I think differently quite often to other people. So I think in, in, I see patterns, I see threads, how th- I see connections, um, big picture stuff. Um, so, but I can hone in on detail when I need to, but it's not my kind of comfort place. Mm-hmm. And so I wondered about this and then I was given an opportunity this spring to take up a teacher training course and just a sort of fairly basic one that um, the content actually because it was about teaching styles and how to hold groups and things like that um, in in an educational form um, there was a huge amount of content around diversity and um, inclusion and so we looked at all the different categories that the law in the UK specifies. Um, and one of the 
new kind of uh, phrases that's being used as neurodivergent. Now, everyone is neurodivergent, that we're all different. But, you know, there are some that are more different than others. And I I believe I and pretty much the whole of my family fall into that that category in mm. on a spectrum. So, you know, I was always aware that my dad was just co- totally could not cope in social circles. I've been thinking about him a lot and how he lived his life because he passed away on the um, on the uh, sol- uh, equinox, rather, last mm-hmm. September. And um, so processing a lot mm-hmm. and really appreciating the way that he managed that inability and still remain- was able to dip into social s- settings on occasion. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that that's really kind of. I hope that answers a little because mm. you know it's it's a it's one a con a question and and a, and a place that I hold. I'm more ready and willing to hold now. Mm. Whereas mm. before I was all in. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. I have to say when I heard when I read Wild Edge. Um, the 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 way Edge came to me or Edge Edge Walker was was like I was thinking of like you know Edge of um on the edge of something like on the edge of some you know like a change or a, a transformation or like you know you're on the edge of, of 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 yeah some something like a step forward a step backwards and kind of like the unknown and I hadn't really in, thought about it in terms of on the outside of belonging and so hearing you to describing that like it feels a bit different it feels different because this is a this is relational whereas I'd imagined it was more like a personal internal thing um and so yeah I think that that's so powerful to to think about you know all the ways that you're you've been on the living on the edge um <laughs> you know on yeah on the edge of things and but able to take that position now like being comfortable taking that going this is actually what I need and what feels comfortable to me and that allows me the choice to to dip in and dip out and you know like the tides move in and move out as you need to um especially having realized there's some neurodivergence within you and you know with your family as well and like probably I'm sure the the sense that that makes to you um but knowing that that supports you as well this this position of uh, of being on the edge and yeah on on an island in the middle of the you know in in the, in the sea like between between two two countries um i think that that's like yeah such a perfect um metaphor if that's the right word um for, for being so on, on the edge it is so funny as well, and because Jersey is doesn't belong to France or England or the UK, um, although it, it actually unified the two in 1066, or there's certainly Normandy. Ah. But uh, um, this is sort of going into kind of um, real sort of old his family stuff. But um, so my dad mo- moved here when I was a child with my mum lived on the island until 94, went to live in France, then went back to England in 2013. And it was then when he, he looked into a bit of his family history, his so the paternal side, and mm-hmm. um, discovered that the family name of Bond wasn't English or from the southwest at all in Devon. Um, it was actually Norman from Normandy. And um, so my ancestors were part of the army um, that defeated mm-hmm. Harold. At, wow. You know, yeah. and, uh, and But they also were Norse, so they, they were Danes. They were Vikings. <laughs> so it's, it's really the, the patterns that um, shape our lives are extraordinary. So my dad... You know, his family came from this area a thousand mm. years ago. Mm. So he had no idea that he was actually, in effect, coming home. That's incredible. 
Wow. How special to know that. That's, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. I, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and so I, I'm really curious about your, your journey to like discovering this about you. And, you know, you've talked about like finding peace in nature as well. And I'm really interested to to hear more about what it is about like the wild, like of, of, of the earth and, and nature and, and being in nature that's really supported you. Like when you, when you first discovered that it was a, a wild edge, a place that was comfortable for you or, or, or whatever it was, I'd love to hear more about what it was that you were searching for in, in nature um, and, and what you found. So as a background, I've experienced what is called MECFS with accompanying kind of conditions um, since I was a teenager. And just to clarify, could you tell us what that is, if that's okay? So so, uh, MECFS is uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis. Um, So it's a, a chronic illness with deep fatigue that is rarely restorative. You know, any rest is not particularly restorative. And but it has taught me so much about pacing my life. Mm. And it's given me space to actually be. That um your question really goes to loss and grief. Um so I have four children. I'm really, really fortunate and grateful. And they're just they gifted me so much joy in my life. Um but I lost five pregnancies, mm. five miscarriages. One of which was in between my third and fourth child. In the second trimester, and was abrupt ending, um, totally unexpected, and. Um, just hit me like a ton of bricks but um with all the expectations of managing a young family and I was a full-time mum with a very busy husband who was rarely at home Mm. didn't feel I had any support at all and it was you know it's a long time ago now but you know still I know that losing um through miscarriage or postnatally is just not spoken about mm. yeah and it's very much a taboo subject you know you have even try to bring it into a conversation you can just see that you know that the the other person or people are just like whoa <laughs> mm. you know don't want to go there and um and my whole um, oh gosh, I I can still feel that kind of sucking in mm. of 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 holding and um trying to find a way to um be okay for my kids particularly mm. and manage each day, even though I was just uh, devastated. The, the, I think the most, the deepest feeling of loss I've ever remember, and um, I would I had my young child, and you know what a toddler, not even really only just a toddler, as well as two older ones, and um, I am um, would go out with him while the others were at school, just go for long walks or just go and sit at the, on the beach. At the, and I found actually going to the beach. I'm really fortunate on an island. We can go to different kind of places very quickly. Um, but I had a really lovely beach to go to, and it was springtime, and the weather was iffy. But I found that actually I got more. I felt I was more embraced when it was stormy, when the waves were crashing. 
and there's so much kind of energy. I felt, I guess, because I was holding tight and there was so much energy in that holding that I needed that release, Mm. a place where I could be, you know, sort of in tune with the waves, with the wind, and and move quite frenetically if I needed to. And with a young toddler, you know, he just thought it was fun if I would just run along the sand or something, you know, and just just jump around, you know, on the edge of the waves and stuff. So it was that kind of, um, yeah, it wasn't, you know, I think a lot of people when they think about grief, they think about, you know, um, just flatness, you know, and, and no energy. But actually I felt enormous energy. Mm. And um, it wasn't able to manage it normally. So I was I found that in company I would be really, really um well just not being able to speak. <laughs> mm. And and just want to retreat all the time. Yeah. Mm. Back to so, nature but, or back, back into yourself. Me. Back mm. to myself. So in the company of people away from nature. I mean it's lucky I lived in the in the countryside. Mm. So I had that at home, but it was particularly when I had to go out and meet other people, different, you know, whether it's just doing the shopping or, you know, going to an event or to meet up friends, I just couldn't connect. Hmm. And the only place I could connect um, was at that time at the beach um, with the water, with the sea, the ocean. Yeah. Mm, That's very powerful. Thanks for sharing your story, and I'm so sorry you experienced that. I can only imagine the the heartache and loss and the isolation you must have felt at that time as well. Um, But how incredible to have found solace and a place to release and connect in nature that's all around you. Um, and, And so did you learn from that that nature was this place that you could turn to throughout other um, times of grief and loss or change or or turmoil in your life as well? Well, I actually remembered that I'd always done it. Mm-hmm. But it just, um, you know, as, as a child, um, when my parents split, I was really young mm-hmm. and unusually, um, that my brothers and sister and I were um, left in full-time care with my dad. Mm. And uh, we lived in the countryside and opposite some woods. And I found, I remembered that I used to spend all my time in the woods. And so the trees became friends, but they also became place of safety and um, felt um looked after and cared for so they the trees themselves became like um a place i would uh, think of as mother mm. yeah. Uh, yeah and that has you know in in my life now has been translated into this deep connection and working for myself with nature and partnering with nature and be, you know being nature and then helping others now um, to connect in, and build relationship in the same way. Hmm. It's it's really interesting because I really resonate with that. I When I was a child and things were difficult or not safe at home, I would go out. We used to go out, you know, the whole day, like not like now where children can't can't really do that in the same way, but would go out for the whole day and, you know, just come home to eat and, were just I have I have memories and visions of being out in the woods or in the fields and or down by the the you know the streams and the rivers and it was I grew up in the middle of England not by the coast at all um but just feeling so tranquil um and like I could have a deep exhale um and like everything was okay and 
much more predictable. I've always found nature much more predictable than people. Um, and uh, I, I hadn't realized that until, you know, until I guess the last few years, whenever, um, I don't really know when it came to me, but I didn't realize that at the time as a child, it was, you know, it was just that place of, um, of, of safety and, uh, and yeah, I've, you know, spent years living in cities and, and just thinking, oh gosh, you know, just longing for open stretches of land. And, and now I live somewhere that's, that's rural and we're surrounded by farms and fields and uh, trees and, you know, all of just beautiful nature. And uh, it just feels so, I feel my nervous system just completely so much more regulated and uh, I feel just so much better in myself and much more grounded, even in the frenetic days of having small children. Um, it's, it's, it's such medicine. Um, and you sharing that really reminds me of that. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's fascinating that you're now helping people to, to, you know, go out into nature and and guiding people to to reconnect um and I, you know i'd love to hear I, ha- I had a theory as well not a theory but a question and i i feel like you know people are afraid of nature these days um and and maybe what might be found there or found in themselves and i just wondered whether you find that in your work and i'd love to hear about the work that you do and how you help people and, and, and what that gives people but why do people need a guide to go out into nature? Hmm. So that's something that I'm often asked or has been put on, you know, sort of in, in social media about why would you need a guide to go into nature? Well, it's just when you lose connection with anything, it's helpful to have a guide to find, help you find your way back. Because of my history of the ME and CFS um, and the breakup of my marriage, I ended up with, and I already had severe back pain for a long time, resulting from an accident in the 80s. Um, But it became really very, very bad around about the breakup. Mm. And I really needed to um, find some solution to help me because it was like really debilitating and um I went to a local chiropractor and he was really helpful um lovely guy but he just said to me Amanda if you get a chance go to a cranial sacral therapist because I don't feel like I can su- support with your needs and um there weren't any in Jersey at the time and especially in the biodynamic way of working with non-manipulative and so I had wanted to start doing something to come back to my love of plants and natural medicine which I'd always brought my children up on and um, so I started this course in in London in Neil's Yard and it introduced me to being in a group of women uh, and on a monthly basis um, as well as learning about natural medicine. And uh, it was a really incredibly um, curated course with some amazing um, presenters and teachers. And it was just a huge medicine for me at the time. And at the same time I was there, at the, the actual Niels Yard place in Covent Garden had various therapists available. And I had was introduced to biodynamic craniosacral. And that depth of listening to my body by the therapist um, enabled me to come back into my, or start the journey of coming back into my body. Because, you know, I felt like I was totally out there. (laughs) And... um, so that was the beginning of the journey into, into the body again and feeling safe to be in my body. And 
every single time I went into nature, I found that was became easier. So it was the what I, what I was doing is now being in the framework of forest therapy guiding. What I was mm. doing was connecting through my senses, through you know our, our outward senses, but also all of our internal senses, which are huge, which are massive. And so it got be, I was stepping in to me and who I was, am, mm. and um, that early work shapes what I do now. And it was it was totally uh, an embodied felt experience, facilitated then by because the craniosacral helped me so much with my back pain that it um, I actually went into training as a therapist myself, and that was the beginning of my journey as a therapist. Mm-hmm. That couple of years training was like a real embodied journey. Um. And then I practiced as a therapist for a number of years. But I had more and more women coming to me with all kinds of um, pain, um, anxiety, depression, but many issues around the menstrual cycle. And um, a lot to do with loss and grief. And it became i became more aware that i needed to offer more and that i always always brought in elements of nature my i practiced from home and had trees plants as much as possible around as well as um elements within my practice room mm. and um i always suggested to my clients that they practice you know just spending time outdoors you know and not suggesting any particular thing but just saying oh is there a favorite place in nature that you like you know perhaps you could spend more time there that's simple things you know like that and so I eventually ended up doing a master's degree in mindfulness-based psychotherapeutic practice in a buddhist tradition so it was a a real synthesis of western psychology and buddhist psychology Mm. and I'm not a buddhist I'm not you know, I don't identify myself in any particular religion, but I feel more connected with the earth and nature as mother. So that has led me um, through the depth processes in the psychotherapy training into um, more crying, te- you know, huge amount of time in tears. Um, mm. well, um, not just physical losses, but the loss of things that I had expected in my life, um, the way th- I thought things would play out, and and sudden, you know, and they didn't. So that was a more difficult process, and um, to align with and accept. That um, I actually. 2005 had a, an experience in in nature on my own solo retreat if you like five days off grid in a mountain on the side of a mountain that um completely um made me surrender and it was the act of surrendering that changed my life transformed everything mm. Mm. Fascinating. That sounds amazing. What a powerful experience. I'm sure in that moment you had no choice but to surrender and realizing that you're still, you know, what you need and what you don't need and and who you are and whatever else came up for you. I think that must have been, yeah, I can imagine that being really powerful. Incredible. And I love what you're saying about, you know, returning to the earth as mother as well, especially for you know, people who've not had mother present in in their life or perhaps in the way that's been expected or when tending to losses and griefs and, um, you know, in those descent moments of life and those initiations, I've found that the earth as mother can really hold me and give me some of 
that that feminine yin presence and and holding and strength and support and unconditional love as well um in the way that the earth is 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 there no matter what and can hold all of it and transmute a lot of energy and emotions um away from us and back into composting it into the earth and um and helping to release in that way has been really powerful for me um i'd just love to hear a bit more about how um you know any any practices that you have that help you connect to the the earth as mother is there anything that you anything that's not being shared that that you would like to share about um you know really being held in that way i guess I think for me, it's always amongst trees Mm. Um, and different trees will offer something unique as they are all unique. I think they have characteristics, certainly, Mm. um, you know, the way that our stories as human beings connect us with woodland and trees, you know, there's this kind of folklore in different traditions of that way of trees and um in recent years i've tried to sort of acknowledge those but put them aside and and just and she just meet a tree or a plant and sit with it and try and discover something for myself by listening and and just exploring, you know, with all my senses, sitting with a tree, you know, um, changing the way I, um, I move around the tree or sit or stand, getting to know the tree and just opening a space for communication and introducing myself. And then being, uh, and on one occasion I was told, no, that's not, not your name. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what were you told was your name <laughs> you were given standing, a name standing tall it came in two phases um but standing tall with wind in her hair oh, wow yeah I see that in you that's very <laughs> special yeah. yeah amazing I love that practice that's beautiful thank you um, and I'd love to ask you as well about, you know, you've talked about your neurodivergence and, you know, that you um, you said that your passion and calling is to support others in understanding this sensory world. And, um, you know, just curious from from your practice, yeah, why, why does this practice really support people with neurodivergence to, um, yeah, in, in, a, in a therapeutic way? Talk to us about that. We're, 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 we're sensory beings. Our whole body is informed by our senses. But we live in a world that shuts that down. Um, my feeling is that anyone who is neurodivergent, wherever they are, and that's movable, I believe, is more perhaps more in tune with the senses more uh, more able to feel more in some ways and is affected by the way we live our urban lives so that actually the bombardment of noise and busyness um is so alien that we're kind of like canaries in a coal mine and that have to retreat to be able to cope with the level of toxicity in the environment in whatever shape or sense or form that is so there's a kind of sense in feeling that there's a sensory overload but it's a homeopathic response as you treat that by coming back to the senses so you're treating light with light everything is sensory in nature so when we return to and reconnect we are returning to a potential that is fully engaged and alive and connected 
so that we can act as an individual, but we can also act as one. Hmm. That's at the heart of it, I think, is my kind of knowing, if you like. Mm-hmm. 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 It's taken me a long time to be even begin to be able to put some words to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but the becoming a, a certified forest therapy guide really has helped me work within a framework to for me to share my own experiences and um, help others begin to have that similar relationship again with nature. And um and but now I'm moving more into my own ground and feel that all these um pieces of the puzzle that have supported me now need to be put together. And um not to produce something, you know, another method or you know mm-hmm. modality, but mm-hmm. just it's me being whole and mm-hmm. presenting all of me rather than these pieces that I, I say are me. Mm-hmm. It's like you're harvesting all of your life's experiences and bringing them all together and, and just guiding people into all the things that you have, like in your toolkit, yes, but also all the things that are just the full aspects of, of who you are. It's, I get, I get that real sense. I think that's a really powerful gift of you know perhaps the other side of menopause but you know that life experience as well and and having lived through so much as you have I think that's an an incredible place to be in it sounds like really important work to help people to come back to safety in nature safety in their body in themselves and they reconnecting to the whole of themselves as well um and and i i think that's really powerful to hear your stories on on grief and and moving through grief and being held by the great mother the earth and and being able to be held in the safety of being able to express and release your emotions when people aren't able to to hold that in you i think you've shared so much with us that's that will speak to so many people about their own experiences of being able to contact and feel and express their own grief and their own um sensitivities as well so thank you so much amanda and um i'd just love to ask you one last question i think um you know coming back to to cycle wisdom and and and, you know cyclical um our cyclical senses what is the greatest gift that you have found in understanding your own cyclical nature wholeness Mm. reclaiming pieces of myself that had been put aside have um i've been hiding you know that were hidden for safety reasons and um all those kind of things that we've been talking about um, but also, the, you know, when the greatest gift amongst it all has been discovery of joy, I mean, and um, a sense of freedom. I always used to think, oh, searching for freedom, where is it? <laughs> what is it? And it actually, <laughs> now I'm realizing it's, you know, it's, it's to be yourself mm-hmm. and feel able to step beyond expectations and, um, so that's the gift of where I am now as as a woman and um, feeling more able to step into that more and more. Um, some years ago, uh, a young friend of mine who's a therapist um, invited me to join a crone ceremony. And um, so I think she wanted me to half support the thing as well there was another woman holding the whole gathering and there were the other women that were joining were older than me so they they were definitely in that kind of 
perceived age of Crohn's. Mm. And I was just, I was on the threshold you know, at mm. that time. Edge um, dwelling. Yeah. <laughs> it, still, it was, um, yeah, even there. So I was still, <laughs> I really loved it. And I loved the whole idea and concept of being crowned. Because mm. that's what the crown is. Mm. As crowned as the elder. And um so feeling like I, I'm, I've stepped over that threshold now, mm. and that I can really start to move in a very empowered way. That you know I'm, whereas from so long I would not speak up for myself, not say no. Um, that I was always. Um, what you know, this whole title of people pleasing really is it's a survival mechanism. Yeah. And yeah. um so I've moved away from that. So, mm-hmm. you know, if there's a challenge, you know, I will stand my ground now. Mm. Amazing. You know, and begin to mm-hmm. be able to find the words in the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, the nervous system is regulating after being completely frazzled yeah and so that and nature is my total support in that mm-hmm. so that's nature helps your nervous system come back to where it should be operating from mm. yeah that's so awesome to hear i'm curious if you had or are you will you have a crowning croning ceremony for yourself I'm really feeling like that I need to do something like that, you know, and this summer it would, would seems like a, you know, maybe next month, it seems mm-hmm. like a really good time to plan that. I'll go for a medicine walk. Yeah. And um, I haven't done that for a while and find going on medicine walk, either for a morning or a whole day. So incredible, such an, an incredible experience. Mm. Do you want to just quickly tell us about that? What that involves? So it's a it's a kind of um, you you set up a threshold um, of where you choose to start from, and you set an intention um, for your medicine walk. Maybe you have some kind of question or some issue in your life that you need some clarity around. Or well, it could just be you know where am I going? <laughs> mm. um, it's, um, and whatever sense that is, and. So you set up that intention, you set up the initial threshold. You usually have someone um, holding space for you, but not always. But I usually set up a kind of circle in the on the ground with some natural elements. That is where I step into to start the medicine walk from and I return to. Mm. So once I step in, I'm in a different realm. Mm. So I don't acknowledge anyone i'm invisible that you know that even if i see people i just act as if i'm invisible and as i move along the route and it can deviate um so if i come for example to a fork in a path or something like that then i'll stay stay there for a pause and think so which way you know and allow my body to inform me all the time and what is I am the information I'm receiving from the nature around me. And there's so many metaphors come into play, symbolic symbolism. It's an extraordinary vision quest, if you like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what was coming up for me, the the vision quest. I undertook a vision quest in the, the probably nine months ago now. And um I was just really thinking of when I set up a, a, a circle around my my camp and marked the elements and the um, the directions and did something similar without going for a walk because I wasn't allowed to leave the place, but to let my body just be there, like the needle of the compass that, you know, where do I want to sit and tend to and you know, in which direction and what what is it in nature that that's represented in those um those directions and an amazing amount came up even though I was just from the outside looked like I was doing nothing I love that process of 
the idea of doing that as, as a walk, even if you there are people there and you know it doesn't have to be for multiple days, it can be for, like you say, a, a little while and um, but letting your body lead and guide you and really tuning inwards, um, setting that intention, setting into sacred space, whether you have a witness or not. And I was thinking how beautiful that would be. It feels like, you know, in in in, in menstrual cycle awareness is a you know beautiful practice to do with your with um with your bleeding as like this vision time and setting an intention for the new cycle. And you know, you might do it with the moon, but you know, I just had this real thought like, oh, wouldn't it be beautiful to do, you know, instead of necessarily retreating to a still place for a time but to go for a, a a gentle walk out into nature and to do a medicine walk that way and just letting it be this intention of or, or anything the start of anything the start of anything or any time needing guidance that's beautiful that's beautiful practice thank you for sharing that I'd like to try that for myself yeah thanks Amanda well, thank you. It's been absolutely beautiful to get to know you um, and to chat with you and to hear your story and your experiences and the, about the incredible work that you're doing. And um, I just would love to ask you to share with us um, where people can come in and find you to find out more about your work, follow you um, and see what you're offering. Well, thank you so much, Sean. It's been a, a real pleasure and um, very easeful, um, flowing conversation. So really honoured you in that and you holding this. No, thank um, you. So where can you find me? Hmm. So I've been talking about visibility already in our conversation mm-hmm. today. So, So I do have a website. And it's www.wildedgewalker.earth. And um, I also on Facebook and LinkedIn and um, Instagram. I've actually got three separate profiles on Instagram. And I can send you details of that. Perhaps you can share. Um, I'll pop them in the, the notes. The, yeah. The, the main one is Wild Edge Walker. Hmm. And um, I changed the type very slightly recently there's wild edge walker healing blue i'm changing stuff at the moment so it's um i'm tweaking um mm. playing around um to become more visible and um uh, yeah so it's yeah. an on journey and in, in showing up yeah um yeah excellent i love that is this real i can really feel this transition that you're in this 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 uh you know I, I hope I hope that you do have your croning ceremony because it feels like that's what you're really stepping into and, and claiming that you know you're here you're you're arrived and uh yeah putting yourself out there as as this powerful magical crone that you are so amazing I, I love all of that and of course yeah I'll pop all the links into the show notes so anyone listening can go and find Amanda um and yeah thank you so much wish you a beautiful summer in the northern hemisphere um and yeah a blessed a couple of months ahead with everything you've got going on thank you so much um yeah really appreciating being here and um just spending time with you thank you again thanks amanda Thanks so much for listening to Wildflow. I love having you here. If you're loving this podcast, please show your love by leaving a review and a rating and share your fave episodes with those who you think would love to listen to to help share this passion project of mine with the world far and wide. To take the next step and learn how to live, love and lead and flow with your cyclical nature or for deep guidance and support in your cycle embodiment journey, discover my freebies, online journeys, trainings and coaching on my website at www.charlottepronto.com. Until next time, go well with the flow of your body's cyclic nature.